Okay, today we're going to do a message on anger in the life of a Christian. What does the Bible have to say about being angry? Uh, is it acceptable? Are there good types of anger? Are there bad types of anger? That's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, in keeping with the theme of this message, I just want to show you a couple news articles quickly. Just to show you that times aren't getting any better. Um, just show you here quick. Just how nutty religion is getting. You have here the blessing of the motorcycles. Cedar Grove Presbyterian Church will have a blessing of the motorcycle service on Sunday, June 9th. Worship will begin at 10 a.m. They will provide lunch at 11.30 a.m. Kickstands are up at 12.30 p.m. I'm sure that's scriptural. Wait, this big airplane goes over. Breathe for Olivia. Motorcycle ride will be a benefit ride. Donations welcome at the registration table upon arrival. Come on, come on. Pastor Chris. More information call Pastor Chris. Now maybe that's a, a man, but I don't know. Here in America, that's typically the, the short name for Christian or Kristen. You know, kind of like a female pastor. Can't say for sure, but then look at this one. This one's really funny. Here, hold on. Invitation to worship. We are KP duty because our names are Kathy and Pam, and we have been called from the kitchen to the pulpit. Chapter and verse? Are you kidding me? Of course not. To proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in message and song. Isn't that wonderful? Kathy... Henry and Pam Nelson will be ministering at the Little Rights Church on Route 155 in Port Allegheny, PA, on Sunday morning, May 5th, 2013 at 11 a.m. Oh, nuts, we missed the service there. What a shame. Oh, uh, yeah. The Bible says that women are to be keepers at home. And these feminazis right here rebel against the Word of God and say we're going to be, we're called from the kitchen to the pulpit. Even though the Bible says, I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Women are not called to be pastors. Okay, there we go. So now if you're angry, you're ready for the sermon here. We're going to begin today by looking at the law of first mention. I do that a lot of times when I'm preaching a sermon. You look up the very first time a word is used in the King James Bible, and then a lot of times it's defined within the context. So we're going to go first to Genesis chapter 27. Take your King James Bible and turn to Genesis 27, verse 41. That's where we're going to start at. I'm going to show you the first time the word anger is used in your King James Bible. Genesis 27, verse 41 through 46. It says here, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. It's interesting there. Let me just stop for a second. Esau hated Jacob. But what does the Bible say about Esau and God and Jacob? It says, uh, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Hmm. So God loved Jacob, and he hated Esau. And that's what the Bible says. It does not say that God hated Esau's sin. It says he hated Esau. Very interesting. Back to the verse here. It says, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. He was so angry he wanted to kill. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, thee doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away. Now here it is until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him, then I will send Then I will send and fetch thee from thence, 
why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Okay? And uh, well, we'll just read verse 46 here to close it. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? Okay, that's how it ends there. She doesn't want her son messing around with the descendants of Ham. We'll talk about that in just a little bit here too. But notice the first time there the word anger is used. It's in, used in reference to Esau being so mad at his brother Jacob that he wants to kill him. Okay, and there are going to be times that you're going to feel that way. I mean, let's just look at reality here. There are going to be people that are going to make you so mad in this life that you're going to just be like, I just wish I could... that make you mad enough to want to kill them. Of course, don't do that. But uh, what is the actual first recorded instance where somebody's mad, okay, where they, they have anger, you know, you can see that they're angry. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now the word is, anger is not used here, but you're going to see it uh, in type, basically. You're going to see it that um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but you'll, you'll see anger here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel." Now, it doesn't come right out and say that God was angry at them, but you read the context of it there, obviously I don't think he was speaking in soft tones. Obviously he was a little mad, you know. So, very interesting, who was the first person to get mad in the Bible? Who was the first being, I'll say, to get mad in the Bible? God. Now, there's a lot of references in the Bible, in your King James Bible, to the anger of the Lord. And it's a very, very fearsome thing to have God mad. It's not a good thing when God gets angry. Okay? And you see that time and time and time again in the Bible. But we're not going to focus on those times when God gets angry. I want to focus on when people are getting mad. You know, when man gets mad, what happens and the result of it and everything. But now let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Now this would be the first instance that I can see. You know, maybe Adam was a little bit mad at his wife there. But uh, this would be the first instance where you actually have man being mad. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew, his, knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. He was mad. Okay, verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So that anger there that was in uh, Cain, it actually led to him killing, murdering his brother. 
the first time that innocent blood is shed there outside of the land that was slain you know when Adam, Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden but that anger that Cain had actually led him to murder his own brother his own flesh and blood and notice it was not a, a quick temper kind of an anger that he got mad and just went over and killed his brother huh it built up and built up and built up he had it in his heart he kept it inside all right that's going to be important to remember for later he kept that anger and held on to it and it became bitterness and then it eventually turned into sin i don't want to get ahead of myself here but let me just say this there's nothing wrong with being angry okay that's just a normal emotion that you're all going to feel that we're all going to feel okay the problem is when that anger turns to bitterness and then that bitterness leads to sin we'll see that in the study today but can it lead to other sins are there other sins that can come about as a result of anger turn to genesis chapter 30. genesis chapter 30 we're going to start at verse 1. And this is one a lot of people are guilty of, and I've been guilty of it myself sometimes. Genesis chapter 30, verse 1. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel, and he said, Am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? So what is Jacob implying there? He's implying that Rachel is in sin. And that it's God's the one that's, that's holding this from you because obviously you've got some kind of problem. Now was that the right thing to him for him to do to his wife? No. He should have comforted her. He should have said, honey, I don't know why. I don't know why you haven't had children yet. I don't know why. You know? But him, him saying that to his wife was the wrong thing to do. He wasn't a very good husband at that point in time. Verse 3, And she said, Behold my maid Bilna, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees, that I may also have children by her. Well, that's a stupid thing to do. She shouldn't have done that. And look what comes of it. And she gave him Bilna, or Bilhah, I'm sorry, her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in unto her, and Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and hath given me a son, therefore called she his name Dan. Hmm. Dan, the tribe of Dan. I'll do a study on that sometime. If you want to see what God thinks of the tribe of Dan, go back to Revelation chapter, I have it written here, 7 verses 4 through 8 where the 144,000, 12,000 from each of, the, each of the 12 tribes are chosen. The tribe of Dan's never mentioned. God got rid of the tribe of Dan. He had no respect for the descendants of this sinful relationship here. And I do believe it was a sin. Some people would say, well, no, no, you know, the tribe of Dan was no good. And you see a lot of times why these, these, the children of Israel, they're sinning and things and getting out of fellowship with the Lord. I believe that that's the reason right there, because some of those descendants of Jacob were actually conceived in sin. Okay, I don't believe it was right for him to go in unto his wife's handmaid. I think that that was wrong. So sometimes your anger, you do something stupid like that, and then to appease, you, you actually get into sin. To make things right, you actually go into sin. I think that was wrong. I think Jacob should have answered his wife Rachel a better way than the way he did. First Peter chapter 3 verse 7 says, Likewise ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Many times a husband can forget that his wife is more sensitive emotionally than he is. And he can respond in anger when he shouldn't. See? Anger. If you remember last week's sermon, it was logic versus emotion. Anger is not always logical. Sometimes it is. Sometimes anger is a logical response to something that happens in your life. But you need to take care of that anger. Okay, and we're going to talk about that later. Because if you let it go, 
that anger can turn into an emotional response and you can end up doing something stupid. Like, a, like Jacob just did right there. Fathering a tribe through a, a, one of his descendants named Dan and that tribe never amounted to anything and actually turned on God and God said, cut them off. They're not going to be restored. There is no restored tribe of Dan in the book of Revelation. Very interesting. Turn next to Genesis chapter 32. We're going to see another example of anger. Genesis chapter 32. Wait a second. I have that written wrong. I'm sorry. It's Exodus 32. Looking down, I'm seeing Moses and stuff about Moses, and I'm thinking that doesn't look great. Moses wasn't early on in this early on in the in the book of Genesis. Exodus 32. Sorry about that. I guess that means my notes aren't infallible. Oh boy. Exodus chapter 32. Verses 1 through 6. This is after the children of Israel have been brought out of Egypt. You know, and God's shown all this signs and stuff, and he's part of the Red Sea, and they went through on dry ground, and then he, Pharaoh's army's coming after him, and he brings the sea in on them and destroys them, you know, drowns them out. All the miracles that God did, this is after that. Look what happens here. Exodus 32, verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made, a, made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Well, come on now. You can use pagan ways to worship the Lord, can't you? No, you can't. Okay? You have to serve the Lord the way He says to serve Him. They that worship me, the, the Bible says, or way, they that worship the Lord must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God's not interested in pagan practices being used as worship for Him. Just wanted to kick the uh, CCM movement there and a lot of the other things done in this professing church of today. Okay? It's pagan. You have no business doing that and saying it's worshiping God. Wrong. All right. But uh, it's interesting because obviously these people knew that it was not some stupid golden calf that brought them out of Egypt. What was going on there? Well, they were trying to say, well, we have these other gods and these other things here and we can worship them and God. You know, it wasn't that they said, uh, let's make a feast you know, to the calf. They said, let's do a feast to the Lord with our golden calf. See? You can't do that. And it's kind of interesting because the reason that they were doing this is because they got away from God. And if you forsake your Bible and prayer and you start to listen to the world's music and you stop witnessing to people, there's no telling what you'll end up worshiping and what you'll end up doing. Now look at verse 7 through 10. And the Lord, and this, Moses is up in the mountain with the Lord here. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down, for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. 
Hmm. So God didn't accept their uh, pagan practices as worship to him? No, he did not. God was not interested in what they were doing as worship to him. And he actually said to Moses, let me alone. Don't even try to plead for these people. I want to destroy them. And then I'll make, you know, I'll start over again with you. I'll make, you know, a brand new nation of Israel from Moses instead of from Jacob. Very interesting. Look what uh, Moses' reaction here is. Verse 11. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Now let me just stop there again. Let me kick another thing here, this, this anti-repentance thing. They'll say, God repents in the Bible, so does that mean God's a sinner? No, repentance means to turn from something. Okay, when it's in context for sinners, it means turn from sin. When it's in context we're here with God, it means he's turning from his anger and his wrath. That's a stupid argument that these people use to try and get away from preaching against sin when it comes to converting the lost. The lost people have to understand that they are sinners. They cannot come to God in their pride and in their self-righteousness, like most people do. All right? And they're not truly saved because if you come to the Lord and you're not admitting that you're a sinner, you don't come to Him and drop your self-righteousness, then you're counting on your own good works to save you. Just like 90 plus, probably 90, 95% of people on the earth believe that they are too good to go to hell. That's why you have to tell them that they need to repent before salvation. I didn't say do good works, I said repent. They need to come to God as a sinner, turn from their self-righteousness. Just had to put that in there. But uh, notice too that God was angry. So you see there again, God is angry. Um, verse 13. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Interestingly, because up there uh, in verse 7, the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people. God said, they're your people, Moses. <laughs> and Moses is like, no, they're not. They're your people. And you have to remember that. And of course, God knew that. He was just testing Moses. He was just saying, you know, putting that thing to him and seeing what Moses would, would do, you know, in that time of being tested, okay? And it's interesting because where's Moses at at this time? He's up on the mountain. Can Moses see what the children of Israel are doing? No. Can God see? Yeah, God can see. God sees the wickedness of what's going on, and he's going, I'm just going to kill those people. And Moses is going, is it really that bad? You know, in his mind, he's probably thinking, well, you know, they're probably doing something wrong, but I don't know how bad it really is. But we're going to see here in a minute what happens when Moses gets to see it. Okay, look at verse 15. And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, and on the one side and on the other were they written. And the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. Wow. You mean God actually had written himself on those tables of stone? Yeah. Boy, can you think of the value of something like that? Sure, but let's see what happens to him. Verse 17, And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, This is a noise of war in the camp. It's a rock and roll concert, you know. And he says, Man, it sounds like war down there. And, you know, you listen to a rock concert and stuff, you know. A lot of it does sound like war. Verse 18, And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear? Hmm, quite a racket going on down there. 
Verse 19, And it came to pass as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot. Was he right in getting angry? You better believe it. And he cast the tables out of his hands and break them beneath the mount. Wow. Moses destroyed the original autographs of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Handwritten by God, too, I might add. And he takes them. He was so angry. Did you ever get that angry that you break something? I'm not going to ask you for examples or anything, but have I ever done it? Yeah. I've gotten that angry that I've thrown things and, and broken things. Yep. Why? It's an emotion. But see, that emotion right there, Moses was so angry, he didn't know what was going on when he was up there in the mountain. But when he came down, he saw what they were doing. You're going to see how bad it was here as we continue. And he took those tables of stone and he smashed them down. Now you got to be pretty angry to smash something that God just wrote by hand. Wow, it's pretty incredible. You'd think that there'd be a little bit more reverence, a little bit more respect there, that he'd have been like, well, um, let me set these down on the ground here, and now I'm going to get mad. Ah, uh, he took those tables of stone and just smashed them. Hmm. You ever been there? Did you get that mad? If not, you will eventually. Verse 20. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. Let me just stop there again. Let me kick another movement. This thing of relying on a preacher to tell you what your relationship is supposed to be between you and God. When that preacher gets away from the Lord, oftentimes the people fall apart. Why? Because they put their confidence in man and not in the Lord. Christian, there's one mediator between you and God, and that's the man Christ Jesus. It's not me. It's not some other man down here on this earth. There is no man that is supposed to come between you and your God. You are supposed to deal personally, you and God. Okay. Now there are pastors that can teach you. There are pastors that can preach, that can oversee the flock. I understand that. But when it comes right down to it, you better not be counting on me. You better not be counting on this ministry to answer all your questions. You're going to have to deal with God one-on-one. -on -one. Because if you start to rely on man, when man falls, you'll fall apart. You'll get into pagan practices like the children of Israel did. Let's continue here. Verse 24, And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let him break it off. So they gave it me, then I, then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. Kind of like he's trying to act innocent. You know, I put the gold into the fire and a calf came out. I don't know how it happened. Uh-huh. He's lying. Verse 25, And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Wow. God's people dancing around naked? Huh. Did you know that when you play rock music and a heavy drum beat, there is a desire, strong desire to take clothes off. You say, oh, come on, Brian. Hey, I went to an Aerosmith concert the one time. When I got out of high school, big secular band, the women up front were taking their clothes off. Before I was right with the Lord. Yeah, I was there. Okay, why? The drum beat, the rhythm. It sounds like war, but it's actually singing and dancing and the people start to get into the, into the rhythm and the, and the beat and things, and the clothes start to come off. Why do you think the modern churches, why do you think the women are so scantily clad in there? Why do you think they wriggle and dance and stuff and move their bodies? Why do you think they have seminars on sex all the time? Nothing's really changed, folks. Things are still the same. You say, oh, the Bible's so out of date. That's because you're ignorant. Verse 26, Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. 
and all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. You mean to tell me they, the, all the people didn't run over to Moses' side? Even after all that had just happened, there were still people that were prideful standing on the side of the golden calf that had been melted and stuff, but you know, still people that didn't say, man, I'm on the Lord's side. I'm sorry, I should have, you know, they didn't repent. In their pride and in their arrogance, they just stood there and said, what are you going to do about it? And you're going to see what happened. Verse 27, and he said unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put every man his sword by his side and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp and slay every man his brother and every man his companion and every man his neighbor. And the children of, Ev of Levi did according to the word of Moses and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. Huh. You know, sometimes that you, I'm going to talk spiritually here for a minute. Sometimes you're going to have to slay your relatives with the sword of the Spirit. They aren't going to appreciate it too much, but sometimes you have to do that. When you get angry, don't call them names. Don't be nasty or mean or hit them or something stupid like that. Slay them with the sword of the Spirit. You know, well, you're this and you're that. You're, you, you, when they do that thing to you, you say, well, you know what the Bible says? Whap! And the Bible says again, whap! Go in and slam. Don't say, well, you know, it's my brother, it's my sister, it's my, my mother, grandmother, uh, co-worker, best friend from college. I don't really want to say anything that would offend them. And Uh-uh. Oh. Sometimes they need to be hit with the sword of the Spirit. And if you think God's going to judge you for that, uh, you're quite foolish. But we'll continue here, we'll finish up. Verse 29, For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, even every man upon his brother, or upon his son, and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. Moses there is a type of Jesus Christ. Very interesting. Jesus Christ made an atonement for our sin. Verse 31, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned a great sin. Now he saw what the Lord had seen up on the mountain, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Wow. Would you be willing to go to hell for the lost world? Jesus Christ was willing to take our sins on himself. So again, there you see Moses being a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ really truly fulfilled. Moses offered it, God said no, but Jesus Christ later came and he fulfilled what Moses offered right there. Jesus did die, he did become sin, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What an amazing thing that Jesus Christ did for us. Verse 33, and the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Still true today. That has not changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 15. If you sin against God, and the sin that you commit, by the way, is rejecting Jesus Christ. Dancing isn't going to send you to hell. Pornography isn't going to send you to hell. Cigarettes aren't going to send you to hell. Drunkenness isn't going to send you to hell. Fornication. Murder. Uh, being a thief. All those things won't send you to hell. The thing that sends you to hell is not realizing that you're a sinner. The sin of self-righteousness, thinking that you can save yourself. That's what sends you to hell. That will damn every man, woman, and child on this planet. Because you come to God as a sinner. But let's finish here, this chapter. Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Did you know that God will plague these modern professing Christians because of their paganism? That's why they have all kinds of mental problems. That's why they have to have seminars to try and tell themselves that they are okay and that things are all right. And, you know, all this seminars and stuff like that. That's why they have to do like I showed earlier there where they have to have blessing of motorcycles. 
and all these feminars, you know. That's why they got to do all that stuff. Because the plague of God is upon them. Why? Because they're sinners. They're not willing to repent. Very interesting. All right. How about righteous anger? Show you an interesting one here. First Samuel chapter 17. I have a bunch more scriptures to go to today. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 20. I'm going to read a very famous story here. First Samuel 17, verse 20 says, And David rose up early in the in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him and he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle for Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array army against army and David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren and as he talked with them behold there came up the champion the Philistine of Gath Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words and David heard them and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Just stop there for a second. He hears it and he goes, wait a second, what was that again? What's this promise? That sounds pretty good. But now look at the verse here. It says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You see right there, David got mad. That's what you call righteous indignation. Why? Because the guy was defying the God of Israel. He's saying, who is this heathen? This uncircumcised Philistine, this guy, he's coming up and he's saying, what, I just heard what he said about God. How dare he say that about the Lord? Do you feel that way when you hear somebody blaspheme God's name? Use God's name in vain? You should. Do you feel that way when somebody attacks the Lord Jesus Christ? You should. But now let me make it even more personal. How do you feel when somebody attacks this book? The King James Bible. When somebody says, oh, the King Jimmy Wimmy version. Or when they, they say, oh, it's just a translation. It's not inspired. It's just a book. It's no good. It's just a, it's a stupid old archaic book. Do you get mad? Do you get angry? I do. And you should too. You should get angry about that. You shouldn't say, well, you know, it's not quite the same as somebody attacking God, you know, by name. You're right about that. It's actually worse. Psalm 138 verse 2 says, I worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Hmm. So in other words, God would rather have his name cursed and mocked than the word of God. And you say, Oh, but uh, my professor and my pastor, you know, and James White and, and uh, D.A. Carson and some of these other lying devils, they, they, uh, they say some nasty stuff about the King James, but I, I support them because they're such good men of God. They're not men of God. They're false prophets at best. <laughs> okay? And there are a lot more than that that I'm not going to say. And I'm not talking about profanity either. So don't get excited. The fact is, these men who attack the King James Bible, they're not doing it by the power of the Holy Spirit. There isn't, there isn't one man out there that's going to attack this book and have the Holy Spirit tell him to do it. I don't believe it. No way, not going to happen. You know why? Because all of them that attack this book, they can't provide anything to replace it. They have no perfect authority but themselves in their own little mind. That's the whole issue. They hate the book because it's absolute authority. It's absolute truth. This is thy truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is the book that God has chosen. You say, what about the Geneva Bible? Sorry, he didn't choose that. What about the Bishop's Bible? What about the Texas Receptus? What about the New King James? What about the NIV? Nope. God's seal of approval is on the book. 
the one right here I hold in my hands. Better keep that in mind. Okay. Now what about anger as a result of jealousy? How about that one? Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 5. It says here, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul, with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. They came out to meet who? King Saul. Who was the king? Saul. Was David the king? Not yet. But they came out here to meet King Saul. Now you'd think that the king, you know, he's probably there riding on his horse and I'm here, I'm the king. And look what the women do. Verse 7, And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Oh boy. You get a man who's prideful, he's not going to want to hear that. That some guy who's not the king has killed 10,000 instead of his thousand. You know, thousands versus ten thousands. Verse 8, look at Saul's reaction. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Saul knew that his time was coming. He knew David was going to take the kingdom from him. Verse 9, And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. Mm -hmm. Talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, we're going to read to verse 12 here. And it came to pass on the morrow that, that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul. We're going to talk, see about that. What is the evil spirit from God? What's that have to do with anything? And he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Look at verse 12. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. All the Bible teaches the same thing. All, there's no dispensations. It's all the same thing. Really? So the Lord could come on a man and depart in the Old Testament, and it's the same thing today. I thought the Bible teaches that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Well, then you, you mean it might be different? Yeah. It's called studying to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You have to divide the word of truth. You see, Saul sinned before God, so God said, you're done. And so, the Holy Spirit was upon Saul, and then he left. And God said, okay, you want a spirit, King Saul? I'll give you one. Here's an evil spirit. The evil spirit came from God. Okay? Everything is subservient to God. Don't think that Satan is down there in hell running things, and that God's up there going, oh, no, I didn't know you could do that. Everything is run by God. And somebody gets in sin back here in the Old Testament, God can say, I'm taking my Holy Spirit from you. And King David, by the way, when he sinned, he said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Hmm. And God didn't. God had mercy upon David. Very interesting. And the Bible in the New Testament talks about the sure mercies of David. Yeah. Again, there's a, that's a whole other study we can't get into. But the fact of the matter is, the Old Testament's different than the New Testament in many, many ways. All right. Now I'm going to show you another one. This is kind of an interesting one. Nehemiah. Turn in, the, in your Bible to Nehemiah. Nehemiah
Nehemiah chapter 13. We're going to look at uh, verse 23. Nehemiah 13, 23 says, In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. They were marrying into other peoples, other kindreds that were not Jewish, that were not descendants of Shem. Hmm. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Can you imagine the prophet of God here? This Nehemiah, and he comes in, and he's, he's going up to these people, and he's hitting them, and grabbing them by the hair, and yelling at them. Was he angry? Hmm? Yeah, he was angry. Was he right in being angry? Yeah. You see, God created cultures and customs for a reason. And when you start to mess around, and we're going to see the problem with it here coming up, you start to mess around with other customs and other cultures and things like that, you can start to lose those distinctions. And it was extremely important for the Jews in the Old Testament. Okay, very, very, very important. They were not to marry into other peoples. Okay, I'm not going to use the term race because I understand I had a brother correct me on that and he's right. The word race is not in the Bible. Okay, kindred, people, tongue, nation, those are your Bible words. All right, but back in the Old Testament, they were not supposed to mess with other kindreds, tongues, people, and nations. Okay, they weren't supposed to intermarry with them. Why? Because they would forsake the Lord. Let's continue reading here. Verse 26. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was, was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. What does the word outlandish mean? We kind of make it today as, you know, that's outlandish, you know, kind of like it's really crazy or really far out. But the, the fact is outlandish means out of the borders of your land. That's what it means. Okay, you can read Acts chapter 17 sometime about God's made of all nations of men dwell upon the face of the earth, you know, one blood. And then it says, and has set the bounds of their habitation. Okay, does God still have bounds? I believe he does. All right, I'm not going to go off on a big study on that right now, but the, the fact of the matter is there's something to be learned there. Okay, be very careful about that. Verse 27, Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Joiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. The Levites were one family, okay, the descendants of Levi. They were the family there that was supposed to be the priests that ruled over the things of the Lord. Okay? And that tribe was not supposed to mess up, mess around with even other tribes. They weren't even supposed to, as far as uh, being priests and things. You couldn't have a priest of the tribe of Benjamin or something like that. Uh, -uh. it was the one tribe, the Levitical priesthood. Okay? And those, those priests were marrying other not only just, they, they, it wasn't just other Jews they were marrying, they were marrying other people from other nations. And they couldn't even remember Hebrew, they couldn't even speak Hebrew, these descendants. That's a big problem. Verse 30, Thus cleansed I them from all strangers, and appointed the wards of the priests and the Levites, everyone in his business, and for the wood offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits, remember me, O oh my God, for good. And God did. God certainly did. And by the way, don't fall for this lie that the tribes have intermingled with the other peoples and other nations and stuff, and they're, therefore the nation of Israel is no more. It's just in, in type, it's the church. Replacement theology is what that is. Don't fall for that. That's a bunch of nonsense. Okay? God was able to purify the Levites even after they were messing, messing around with other people, other tongues, and other nations. 
other kindreds. He was able to pur purify the Levites right here in the book of Nehemiah. Now he can certainly do it again today. And he does, and he will. Okay, the time of Jacob's trouble, and that time, that tribe is going to be there. They're going to restore the sacrificial or the sacrificial system there. In the temple, the Antichrist is going to come in at halfway through and, and mess the whole thing up. Again, that's a whole other study we can't get into right now. But uh, what about Jesus? Did Jesus ever get angry? Turn to Matthew chapter 21. They ought to build a pulpit up here or something. I don't know. Kind of hard holding my notes and flipping in the Bible. Especially with the wind blowing. But uh, I think we can get by. Um, Matthew chapter 21 verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Was Jesus right in what he did? Yes. Did Jesus sin in what he did? No. Not at all. You see, one of the great temptations of people that have buildings is to make money off of them. Now, of course, this is in the first century that we're talking about here in the book of Matthew. Now, this never happens today. I want you to understand that. There are no buildings out there that call themselves a church and make money. They don't make merchandise of people. There's no bookstores or coffee shops, Starbucks and things being brought in and making merchandise of people. This is something that happened in the first century and it's done away with now. Uh, of course, you can figure that I'm being a little sarcastic here. Okay, At least I hope you can. All right, turn back to Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to show you here what the condition is for you to be angry and not in sin. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. Matthew 5.21 says, Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. The new versions take that out, making, thus making Jesus a sinner. But it says here, Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Okay? But now, the, the key little word there is, or the three words, without a cause. That's the key to the thing. Okay? You can be mad. You can even call somebody a fool. The Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. You're dealing with an atheist. You can't say, You know, the Bible says that... Um, uh, well, I don't want to say fool because then I'll be in danger of hellfire. No, you have a cause. You have a reason to call that atheist a fool because the Bible said so. But now if you just go to somebody and you say, you know, the guy pulls out in front of you in traffic and you get angry and stuff at him, and you, you, you fool, don't do that. Okay, that's anger out of emotion, not logical anger. All right. Turn next to, we'll see some more examples here. I know it's in Mark. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, verse 1. Matthew 23, verse 1. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, and that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. Now what is that a definition of? They say and do not. That's a definition of being a hypocrite, isn't it? Dissimulation. They say and they do not. All right? And then Jesus goes on for another 39 verses, total of 39 verses there in Matthew chapter 23. He goes on to slam these people. And he calls them hypocrites. 
hypocrites, hypocrites, hypocrites. Over and over and over again, he calls them hypocrites. But he defines it there in verse 3. They say and do not. And he goes on and says, you hypocrites, hypocrites, hypocrites. And it's interesting there. See, where's the verse here? Look at verse 19 in Matthew chapter 23. Ye fools and blind. Did Jesus have a cause though? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now go to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there with, which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth, and he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil, to save life, or to kill? But they held their peace. You mean these Pharisees, these big talkers, had an opportunity, Jesus challenged them to a debate of sorts, you know, to a, a answer for the accusations that they were bringing against him. And he tells the guy, the guy's there, he has this withered hand, and he says, come here, stand forth. Is it lawful to do good, to heal on the Sabbath day? And all these hypocritical Pharisees, if it's wrong, if they're speaking against him, why didn't they speak up? See? They kept their mouth shut, and they just stood there and just sat there. They held their peace. Yeah, they held their peace. And look at Jesus' reaction, verse 5. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees praised God and became Christians. It's not what it says. Verse 6, And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. You mean that there are religious people that would go to the law, to the secular authorities, and try to conspire in ways to have a preacher, Jesus Christ the ultimate preacher, have him destroyed, put to death? But again, we see something in the first century that is not true anymore today. Right? Uh-huh. Organized religion is one of your greatest enemies out there, Christian. Verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his uh, But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea. Okay? Jesus didn't stick around there and declare his constitutional rights. He got out of there. Some good instruction and in righteousness for you. But how about anger in the life of a Christian? Okay. What about that? Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to see what our marching orders are as Christians. Ephesians chapter 4. What does the Lord expect from us today? Look at verse 29. It says here, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking put, be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. There are going to be things that are going to happen that are going to make you angry. The best thing that you can do is to be angry and sin not. You say, where'd you get that from? Jump up to verse 21 in the same chapter there. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. The truth. Okay. Yes, we do have absolute truth, and that's how you should live as a Christian. Verse 22, As he put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye may put on the 
new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You know, I have people all after me all the time saying I'm teaching works-based salvation because I say, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5.17. They say, oh, you're teaching that there's works. Well, there are works involved after you get saved. Okay, works meet for repentance. Somebody gets saved. I'll give you a good example. Uh, Brother Dave Spurgeon. David Spurgeon was, I believe, the second in command of the Outlaws Motorcycle Club. He went to prison for drug charges and for having a fully automatic weapon, you know, gun, and he got saved when he was in prison. Now he goes around the country, he got out of prison, they let him out, they didn't charge him, you know, by the grace of God. They let him out, he cut his hair, you know, he looks respectful, he covers up his tattoos, he doesn't proudly display them from his motorcycle days, you know, being in a Harley gang and a very, very rough gang, the Outlaws, I mean, they're bad guys. He didn't say, I'm going back to the Outlaws. I'm going to go back and hang out at the bars. I'm going to go back and whatever so I can witness. I got to be like the, the Outlaws to win the Outlaws. No, he left it. And it even was a threat to his life. You don't leave a motorcycle gang. There was even a threat to his life. He didn't care. Why? He's a new creature. He put off the old man and put on the new man. He changed. You say, well, the, there doesn't have to be a change when, when you get saved. Yes, there does. If any man be in Christ, if he's a new creature. You're seeing it again here in Ephesians chapter 4. These people, I'll tell you what. Verse 25, wherefore put away lying, speak, putting away lying, excuse me, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now look at verse 26. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Can you be angry and not sin? Absolutely. Yeah. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. That's very, very important. Okay? When you get angry, there are three questions that you should ask yourself. Number one, is this situation my fault? If so, your anger is just emotion. You know, your anger. Your anger is just an, an emotional response on your, pro, and on your part, and it's your fault. It's your problem. If you've done something, and somebody gets mad at you and yells at you, and you get angry about that, well, it's, that's your problem. It's your temper. You have to take care of that. Now, if it's not your fault, is my anger going to lead to bitterness? This thing that these people have done to me, the, what, the wrong that they have done to me, and I'm angry about it, is it going to lead to bitterness within me? And that bitterness can take root in you, and it can spring up, and many people can be defiled. Why? Because you start to gossip about it. I've had that happen about me. People get angry, and it turns into bitterness, and then they start to spread it around, spread around rumors and lies about me, and it turns, and many people are defiled as a result of that one person getting angry at me. All right, drop it. Just drop it. You say, oh, but, but you've wronged or you've done it. Okay, whatever, drop it. We're gonna see about that in just a little bit. Thirdly, how can I take care of this anger? Okay, you've been wronged. It's not your fault. It's not gonna to lead to, to, to bitterness, but how can I take care of this? What can I do about this anger? And let me just give you a little bit of advice out there if you're married. You really, really need to stick with that last part of verse 26. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You better make that a fundamental doctrine <laughs> for your marriage. If you have an argument, I don't care if you're up till 2 o'clock in the morning, get it settled. Go to bed as friends, as best friends. You start to let that anger build and fester and grow, and then you just let the sun go down upon your wrath, you know? And actually, you're supposed to have, you know, by that verse, you'd even have to say before the sun goes down. <laughs> But the, the, you know, the point is, I think really the most important thing is don't go to bed angry. Don't go to sleep angry. Okay? Get things settled. Get things fixed up. All right? Don't hold on to it. It, become, it can become bitterness. And bitterness in a marriage is what wrecks a marriage. All right? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Turn to Colossians 3, verse 5. 
Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 3, verse 5 through 14. It says here, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. You mean you were doing sin back there in the past? But it's past tense? You're not supposed to be walking in those things now? Sounds like the new man again. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. See, we're okay. Verse 11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, and here's another key verse, Put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. You say, well, nobody's perfect. Well, you can strive to be perfect. And what is the bond of perfectness? Charity. What is charity? You say, love. No, that's not the definition. And the new versions are wrong by saying 1 Corinthians 13 is love. Love, love, love. No, no, no. It's charity. Charity is self-sacrifice. It costs you something to have charity. Okay? And brethren, let me tell you this. Sometimes you're going to be wrong. Sometimes you're going to get angry because you've been wronged. But the best thing that you can do is forgive and forget and move forward. Don't let the anger become sin. Be angry and sin not. Sin is bitterness. You can have righteous indignation when you have been wronged, but get rid of it as quick as you can. Give that thing over to the Lord. You say, how do I do that? Let's look here. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. You say, oh, Brother Brian, I have been wronged. I had a professing Christian do something to me. You just wouldn't believe it. Oh, I probably would believe it, but, uh, you know, you've been wronged. You want to get revenge on them? Here's the way you do it. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Notice there the key there, the if, again, Bible ifs. If it be possible, it's not always going to be possible. Verse 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Wrath has a place, okay? Remember the, the verse over there in Ephesians where it said about, neither give place to the devil? The devil can get in and be bitterness in your life. Okay, here it says, give, but rather give place unto wrath. There's a certain place for it. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt have unity. That's not what it says. What's the reason that you are nice to your enemy? Is it so that you can get along and relate to each other and have wonderful love? Uh-uh. Look at this. This is interesting. For in doing so, or for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. It's actually a good way to get back at your enemy. Be nice to him. You know, when you see somebody that's gossiping and it's backbiting and it's a backstabber, and you go out in public and they go, Oh, hello, you know. 
you just look at them and you say, oh, hi, how you doing? You know, glory to God, wonderful day. Praise, praise the Lord. See, there's an old saying, the best revenge is living well. Keep that in mind. Verse 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Somebody's wronged you in your past, forget it. Don't even let your mind dwell on that thing. Move forward. Do the work of the Lord. And when the Lord is blessing you and doing things through you and using you mightily, that miserable reprobate, gossiping backbiter that's, that was a hypocrite and, and did evil things to you, it'll just make them more miserable. Because, see, you'll notice this thing, you'll learn this thing in life. The favorite thing for people that are backbiters and gossipers, you know what they want? They want you to fulfill what they're telling people. They're saying, you're bad, you're evil, you're this, you're, you're you know, greedy, you're, you're uh, you know, ungrateful, whatever else. They want you to fulfill that. But when you look at them and you go, nope, sorry, not going to happen, hey, it's nice seeing you. And you go back to doing the work of the Lord and the Lord's blessing you like crazy and bestowing all these blessings, it'll eat that person up. That's the best way to get revenge on them absolutely the best way you know let God take vengeance on your enemies you can get angry about it I'm not saying you should have no emotions somebody comes up makes funny and does something bad backstabs you you can get angry about that but don't sin with it don't let it turn into bitterness very important now a couple more verses here Proverbs chapter 15 a little bit more instruction in righteousness before we conclude here Proverbs 15, verse 1. There's a lot of wisdom in this book, I'll tell you what. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. It says here, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. When you have somebody attack you, a lot of times they'll start calling you names, they'll resort to name calling, they'll do a bunch of things and just be a total jerk. And what are they trying to do? They're trying to get you riled up. All right? What's the best thing that you can do at that point? Don't let them get to you. Give them a soft answer. You know? And if it gets to the point where they just are, don't want a soft answer and they're just their wrath and their strife, walk away from them. You don't have a responsibility to make everybody get along with you. There are some people that call themselves Christians, and the best thing, thing that you can do, just get away from them. You know, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. Okay? See ya. Walk away. And what's going to happen? Well, the Bible says there in verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God looks down at that evil person, and he says, I see what you're doing. And he sees what you're doing, and he says, that was the right thing to do. That was good. It'll come back. The Bible says that every man will give account of himself to God. The lost go to the great white throne judgment. They'll answer for what they do to you. And the saved are going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. They'll answer there. There is a judgment coming. All right? God's recording everything out there. The Bible says he can know our thoughts. Now imagine that. Think of the God that we worship. He knows everyone's thoughts and brings those thoughts into judgment one day? Hmm. So when you meet that hypocrite professing Christian that's backstabbing you, and in their mind they're going, I hope God does something bad to that person. I just hate them. I just... And they have that bitterness in them. God knows their thoughts, and He's going to bring it into judgment one day. See that you be not partakers with them. Look at verse 18 there in Proverbs chapter 15. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Are you slow to anger? Or do you let your emotions get the best of you? I'll tell you one of the hardest things is when somebody hits you physically or yells at you. It's very, very hard to not let your anger go and build up very quickly. You know, very difficult. 
but you need to get control of that. I'm going to show you how to do that here as we continue. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32. It says here, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. Hmm. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Do you have control of your spirit? Do you let the Holy Spirit control you? Are you slow to anger? You better be. Don't let people get to you. I mean, think about it, Christian. If you're right and somebody is attacking you and persecuting you because you're right, the Bible says that you're to be to leap for joy in that day because your reward in heaven is going to be great. They did the same thing to the prophets. They did the same thing to Jesus Christ. If you're being persecuted for righteousness sake, for something that you're doing right, you're going to be rewarded for that. Don't get mad. You know, get glad. <laughs> you know, seriously though, don't, don't get angry about that. Be slow to anger. Get control of that spirit that's in you. Don't be like King Saul, you know. Uh, this anger comes upon him. This evil spirit comes into him. And it's interesting too. Let me just kick a little something else here. What was King Saul's problem? He was upset because a younger man came in and was more used of God than him. You know that'll happen sometimes? If you're a young man or a young woman and God's doing all kinds of things through you, there'll be some dead church building pastor out someplace that God hasn't used in 20 years and, God, and that guy will look at you and he'll say, boy, God's really doing things through them and they'll get jealous just like King Saul did and they'll begin to attack and they'll begin to say, well, you're not doing this and you're, you're not qualified and, and you, you don't have the right credentials and, and you don't have all this other stuff. It'll happen. And you'll get men that you once looked up to turning on you and attacking you. Don't answer in anger. You should feel sympathy for somebody like that. Somebody that God has put on the shelf. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 11. It says here, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Hmm. His glory to pass over a transgression? Somebody wrongs you and you just go, eh, whatever. Some guy comes up to you and says, you militant, stupid King James Bible believer, you have no credentials, you have no right to be doing what you're doing. Who are you? Who do you think you are? And you just look at the guy and you go, eh, have a nice day, walk away. <laughs> you know what that's gonna be? It's gonna be your, your, to your glory at the judgment seat of Christ. Get back to work for the Lord. You're running a race. You are supposed to not care what people think about you. If you yet please men, you're not the servant of Christ, according to Galatians chapter 1. Don't worry about pleasing men. Don't worry about what men say about you. Get back to work for the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, the book of Ecclesiastes. right next to the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 9. This is where we're going to finish up today. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 9 says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Anger has found a resting place in the bosom of many fools. And then that anger, when it's down there, it leads to bitterness. Don't let bitterness take root in your heart, in your spirit. Okay? Don't let, root, let that root of bitterness grow and defile many other people. Be angry and sin not. And if you're married especially, you better be real careful about anger towards your husband or towards your wife. Don't let bitterness grow up within your marriage. Marriage should be something that you protect, like a precious jewel. The Bible talks about who can find a virtuous woman for her price is, is, is more above rubies. More to be, des far above rubies, excuse me. I had to think there for a minute. Quote a lot of scriptures today, my mind's starting to go on me. <laughs> You're supposed to guard your marriage. 
the Bible talks about a foolish woman plucking down her own house with her hands. All right? Don't do that. Marriage should be something, it's a gift from God. It should be something that you build up, not tear down. And as far as your relationship to other Christians, you're going to get mad. There are going to be some that the, that the devil's going to use in a mighty way to make you angry. And you can be angry, but don't sin with it. Be angry and sin not. That's going to be it for this morning. Let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for another chance to be able to preach your word. Thank you for all the viewers out there that have tuned into this. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us each to take this into consideration. Help us to be angry about the right things. Help us not to be emotional to the point where we don't even think um, that we just get angry right away. We're quick to anger. And uh, I just I pray we wouldn't be that way. I pray that we would be slow to anger and slow to speak as well, that we would think before we open our mouth. And uh, realize, Lord, that everybody out there, doesn't matter what they do to us, they're all going to answer for it. There's no one out there who's going to wrong us and get away with it. They might get away with it down here on this earth, but Lord, you're going to bring it into judgment someday. And Lord, help us to keep that in mind. Help us to stay focused on eternal things and not get sidetracked down here by the lusts of this world. And now, Lord, I just pray that you would take us all out here um, into this world, Lord, this lost world while we're here, and that we would make an impact for Thee, Lord, and, and witness to our co-workers and to our family members and the people we run into and put out Thy Word, Lord, in the form of gospel tracts and, and whatever else we can do in this short life that we have. And I pray most of all, Lord, for uh, the catching away of the body of Christ to happen soon so that we can have that blessed reunion with the dead saints that have gone before us and with the living saints that are here on earth today, that that would happen soon. And I just ask all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. Thank you for watching.